Jack Bogle was the founder of the Vanguard Group, which today holds over $8 trillion in assets under management. Known as the father of index funds, he revolutionized the entire industry by creating the very first one in 1976, making investing cheaper and more accessible to the general public. It's safe to say that this guy knows a thing or two about investing. So in today's video, we're going to present 10 different lessons from Jack Bogle's investment philosophy, which are drawn from his book, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing. Number one, and a central message of today's video, is to invest in index funds. Jack Bogle defined index funds as investment vehicles designed to replicate the performance of a specific market index, providing investors with a diversified exposure to a very broad segment of the market at a very low cost. The most famous example of an index fund in the US is the S&P 500. This index tracks the largest 500 companies in the entire US economy. In contrast to picking individual stocks, by investing in an index fund such as the S&P 500, you're owning shares of these 500 companies weighted by market capitalization. In doing so, you're diversifying yourself across different sectors and exposing yourself to the overall gains experienced by these companies as a whole. Number two is to remember that over the long term, the stock market mirrors corporate profit growth. While the stock market fluctuates significantly in the short term reflecting week to week developments and market sentiment, the long term correlation between the investment returns of companies that are operating in the real world and the total market returns is nearly perfect. What does this mean? It means that over time, the aggregate gains of shareholders must align with the overall growth, the overall performance of the companies, which are typically in the order of five to 8% in real terms per year. It's very important to internalize this relationship because it means that investing in an index fund aligns your stock market returns with the long-term growth of the economy as reflected in the profits of these companies. Number three is to acknowledge the important concept of reversion to the mean. Emotional investing can sometimes lead stock market returns to become excessively inflated. Think back to the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s or to today's popular stocks with very high PE ratios which basically means that prices are significantly disconnected from the fundamental value of their companies. Reversion to the mean suggests that overvalued companies or funds will eventually return to a more realistic valuation that is aligned with their business fundamentals. According to a 2014 Wall Street Journal survey, only 14% of top-rated actively managed funds in 2004 still maintained that rating a decade later. Past performance is a very poor indicator for future results. Number four is that after cost, trying to beat the market is a losing proposition. Bogle emphasizes the idea that actively attempting to pick individual stocks or time the market often results in lower returns for investors. Bogle believed that the costs associated to trying to beat the market, such as high fees, frequent trading, and other expenses, tend to outweigh any potential gains. Instead, he advocated for a passive investment strategy, such as investing in index funds, which aim to match the overall performance of the market rather than trying to outperform it. This approach is based on the belief that over the long term, the market's growth and returns are more predictable and sustainable compared to the uncertainties and costs associated with active management strategies. Number five is to eliminate as much as possible intermediaries to secure your rightful share of the pie. Warren Buffett jokingly adds a fourth law to Newton's three laws of thermodynamics. For investors collectively, returns decrease as motion increases. This implies that higher investment activity leads to increased costs from financial intermediation and taxes, thereby reducing net returns for shareholders. Similarly, Jack Bogle argued that there's a significant conflict of interest between investment professionals and everyday investors in stocks and bonds. We should even view brokers, fund managers, and consultants as professionals who are out there to get a piece of our pie. After financial intermediation costs and taxes, it's incredibly difficult for actively managed funds to beat a simple index fund. From 2001 to 2016, 90% of actively managed funds failed to outperform their benchmark indexes and the S&P 500 outperformed 97% of actively managed funds that are operating in their same space. This begs the question, why would anyone want to invest in an actively managed fund instead of choosing a simple index fund? Number six is to understand the impact of compounding costs. Jack Bogle estimates that in actively managed mutual funds, factoring in management fees, operating expenses, sale charges, loads, and the hidden costs of portfolio turnover, in other words, the frantic buying and selling of stocks, the total cost of owning active funds can reach as high as 2-3% annually. 
No wonder it's so challenging to outperform a simple index fund, which can have costs as low as four to 10 basis points. Consider this example to understand the impact of a 2% difference in costs. The graph shows the evolution of a single $10,000 investment over 50 years, assuming either a 7% market return, which is depicted in orange, versus a 5% return. In other words, after subtracting the 2% in costs, which is depicted in blue. Notice that after 50 years, this 2% difference in returns results in over $160,000 less in your overall portfolio. This is just a one-time 10K investment. Imagine the impact that this 2% has over your whole lifetime of investing. Quick 10 second pause. If you're enjoying today's content, please remember to give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel for more personal finance content. Number seven is that index funds are tax efficient. Index funds allow investors to defer the realization of capital gains or potentially to avoid them entirely through inheritance. Additionally, index funds have very low portfolio turnover because they aim to replicate a specific market index rather than constantly buying and selling securities. This strategy helps to mitigate capital gains taxes. Number eight is to beware of the ETF frenzy. Although Jack Bogle does describe ETFs as a wolf in sheep's clothing, he does acknowledge that there is nothing wrong with investing in indexed ETFs that track broad markets, for example, buying and investing a S&P 500 ETF or a total stock market ETF, provided that they're held for the long run without frequent trading. One of the primary concerns of ETFs in relation to traditional index funds is their ease of trading, which can lead to counterproductive investor behavior when, and potentially to incur in a lot of the costs that were mentioned in earlier points. But more importantly, Jack Bogle worries about the proliferation of thematic ETFs, where you essentially reduce the diversification of your portfolio and place active bets on a small segment of the market. For example, investing in a genomic revolution ETF, a spatial exploration ETF, or even an artificial intelligence ETF. This approach mirrors active investing and increases the risk of investing in overvalued sectors, potentially joining the crowd just as bubbles are forming before experiencing the inevitable reversion to the mean. Number nine is to understand the importance of bonds in your portfolio. Including bonds can mitigate portfolio volatility, offering protection during significant market downturns and discouraging reactive investment behavior such as panic selling when markets periodically decline. Similar to stocks, bond indexes consistently outperform actively managed bond mutual funds. From 2001 to 2016, 85% of bond indexes outperformed them. Number 10 is to acknowledge the importance of asset allocation. An incredible 94% of the variability in portfolio returns can be explained by asset allocation. In other words, how you spread your investments across different types of assets, such as stocks and bonds. Unfortunately, here there's no strong data or scientific approach that we can use to build the perfect portfolio. It's all down to common sense and to your individual risk tolerance, which includes both your willingness and your ability to bear a risk. Younger investors who aim to build wealth through regular investing can afford to take more risk compared to retirees who rely on their portfolios for monthly expenses. Jack Bogle recommends an upper allocation of 80% stocks, 20% bonds for very aggressive investors and on the other side, a 25% stock, 75% bonds for very conservative investors who prioritize stability over potential returns from the stock market. Finding an allocation strategy that is aligned with your risk tolerance will help you sleep better at night when there is a lot of stock market volatility, even if this does mean sacrificing higher investment returns. Hopefully after these insights from the founder of Vanguard, you're excited to start out your index fund investment journey, if you haven't already. For those starting out, I think you'd also appreciate a recent video we did on the importance of reaching your first 100K invested. Please let us know in the comments below which insight resonated with you the most. If you found value in today's content, remember to give us a thumbs up and to subscribe to our channel for more content on personal finance. Thank you for watching, take care, and see you in the next video.